brings off. Oh so episode 24, Crazy Damn Canadians, Mike Nash. I have been a huge fan of yours for a very, very long time. Ever since I moved back to Prince George in 2011, 10 years ago, the first thing I did was I was gifted a copy of your book. And it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. So let's, let's back things up a little bit because reading your, uh, your book, you talk about your, your experience and your, your first impression of coming to BC, but you're originally from the UK and then came to Canada to Ontario? <clears throat> That's correct, yes. I, I grew up in the city of Leicester, an ancient Roman and Viking town, right, right in the very center of, of England, uh, not very far from the geographic center. And uh, I spent uh, some 23 years there. I spent a year in London, at University of London, and uh, got into information technology along the way, and, and that was my ticket to emigrating over here. And like a lot of people, uh, you know, for two years to try it, and uh, with really no thoughts of staying, but of course that's what I did. Absolutely, and yeah. after arriving in Ontario, you you really want to explore the, the country, and so you... Yeah, uh, true, but I mean, my outdoor life really began as a child in Leicestershire, and uh, maybe just backing up a little bit to that, uh, I was born in 46, which was immediately after World War II, uh, different times completely. Uh, my parents didn't have a car until I was about 16, 17 years old, mm. um, no TV until about 1950. Uh, Sorry, after that, fif late 50s, yeah. um, early black and white TV. So you made your own uh, entertainment. We had the radio, we read uh, comics, books, uh, we played games. Um, and my parents introduced me to the countryside, the Leic Leicestershire countryside. So that was my introduction to the outdoors. Yeah. And especially a place called Bradgate Park, which is just just off to the side of uh, the city of Leicester and a little bit west, north and uh, now part of the British National Forest. And uh, it has uh, a hill um, with some claim to fame, uh, the ruins of the uh, house that Lady Jane Grey lived in as a, as a child. She was the nine day queen of England. Um, and uh, uh, the, the hill is topped by uh, a small rock tower called the Old John Tower that uh, along the way, somebody added a handle to it to make it look like a beer mug because the, the gamekeeper, old John, <laughs> w was renowned for that. So this was my um, early uh, outdoor playground. And, and for a you know, five-year-old kid, this was a mountain. And uh, it's perfect. You know, I, I have a, a daughter who's turning five in September. And I, our favorite shared memories together is when there's no technology around, when we're out on a hike in nature together. And that sparks imagination and, and creativity and, and, and a sense of, of calm yeah. as well. And you clearly got that in your childhood as well. I, I, I see that as, a, as an advantage that I had growing up without technology. Um, but in, in a sense, we're part of, the, uh, of a very lucky generation because we were born between uh, not having technology and having it. So today I, I have the advantages of technology. But, but even over here, when I got into remote back backpacking trips, uh, it was before uh, lightweight satellite devices were available. So some of my early trips in the far north were, we, we were right out on a limb, just as our ancestors have been for thousands of years. So yeah. um, I, I, can, I, I couldn't recommend that to anybody today. It's just not fair to the people at home. Um, satellite communication devices are, are so cheap and, and lightweight now. Um, that really, you, you, you know, you have to carry them. But I, I relish the fact that I had the opportunity uh, before that became available. I, yeah, and, and even a, a, a common characteristic that we share in our lives is that we got to experience life before the invention of the internet as well as afterwards. And I think that being part of, of that evolutionary process <coughs> in time is, is amazing, yeah. it really is. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, kids and, and even people in their 20s today have only known life with the internet and and the digital technologies that we're used to leveraging on a daily basis now. So, so I grew up um, in a housing state, post World War housing estate, um, uh, rented from from the uh, local corporation, 
Uh, but we were fortunate that our house was right on the edge of the estate, so we weren't immersed in it. And I also was doubly fortunate in having the only back bedroom. So my bedroom, upstairs bedroom, looked out across the fields of Leicestershire. I could see for maybe 50 miles. Amazing. And uh, looking down into a valley where there were allotments. And, and below that was a railway line. A uh, single track that ran through a tunnel that when it was built, I believe, was the longest railway tunnel in the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Stevenson's rocket went through it and lost its chimney <laughs> in, in the process. And as kids, uh, you know, the big adventure was venturing into this tunnel and they were still operating four trains a day. Wow. And uh, there was absolutely zero room between the tunnel wall and the train. So every few hundred meters, the, there was a tiny little alcove, and that was the only way you could survive if you were caught in there with a train. So that was the big challenge for kids. I mean, today, <laughs> I, I believe there was probably one fatality along the way. But yeah. um, uh, that, that was uh, the adventure the adventurous life that we had on our doorstep. Absolutely. So you were born one year after the conclusion of World War II, so yep. 1946. When did you actually make the move then to Canada? 1969. Okay, 1969. Yeah. And then so it was... So 50, uh, 52 years I've been in Canada. Now. Yeah, and then it was around... So I guess that qualifies me for a crazy Canadian, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so it was 1978 when you moved to Prince That's George. Correct. But before that, you were doing some exploration. I know that you flew from Toronto to Winnipeg and then headed north up to Churchill and Manitoba yes. after that. And yes. you're in search of a polar bear? Not really, but that's what I eventually ended up finding. Yeah. And, and uh, I found myself amidst a, a circle of people uh, that had tranquilized the polar bear in, in the dump. Uh, it doesn't sound very attractive, but that's where you went in Churchill to see polar bears. And um, in fact, you know, they, they directed all the tourists out there. So I, I hooked up with a couple I met on the train and, and shared a ride with them. And we ended up in this circle of vehicles. It was an October day. It was, almost, it was already an Arctic winter there. Yeah. And there's a polar bear. And, and uh, they'd already darted it once, but it, it, it wasn't out. So they, they, they were reluctant to dart it a second time because that could be dangerous mm -hmm. to the bear. But eventually they did. And then... Uh, we all ended up helping them pick this thing up, put it in a, in a transport. And the biologist standing on one side was warning us. He says, you know, if this thing comes around, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and you said October. So, <coughs> I mean, that bear is probably being loading up on, on fats and reserves for, for hibernation. So I'm guessing it was quite heavy. Uh, yeah, it was a female. So um, I don't know whether she was pregnant or what, but she weighed about 600 pounds. Wow. But you try picking up a 600 pound piece of jelly with so much fat and that's, that's what it was like. That's and it, it took five men and a lot of leverage to finally get it into. Wow, that's a memory that will stick with you home. for life, eh? Just yeah, it, in fact, that, that is to this day, my closest ever bear encounter was with a polar bear because I actually got to handle it. Good, not too many people can <laughs> say that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really want to get into uh, a lot of the other wildlife that you've seen on your, your journeys sure. and your hikes later in the, the podcast, because that's fascinating to me, especially an experience with a, a wolverine. And I'm looking forward to talking about that. So another trip that you made, I, I believe it was in 1977, spring of 1977, but that was your first experience with BC. You flew into Edmonton. Not my first experience with BC, okay. but my first experience with the North and Prince George. Oh, okay, so yeah. Edmonton, you took the train to Prince Rupert. That's right. What was that like? Uh, it was great, um, and, and a little historical fact here. Um, but I also have a, a side interest in aviation, by the way. But um, uh, so I, my first nine years in Canada, I worked uh, with and for Air Canada. That's right. In, in the telecom yeah. field, primary computer communications. Um, and it was a li uh, historically um, the two transcontinental railways was, was Canadian National and Canadian Pacific in more recent times, anyway. And when the first transcontinental airlines uh, came to be, they followed the railways. And in fact, Canadian Pacific uh, then had CPA, Canadian Pacific Air. And not many people realize it, but Air Canada in those days was owned by Canadian National Railways. 
Wow. It was kind fact. of a technical thing. It was a paperwork thing. It was the way the government uh, chose to set it up, yeah. being a Crown Corporation at the time. Yeah. So they weren't a public company? Or, no. Yeah. So technically on paper, uh, Air Canada, we were owned by Canadian National Railways. So one little known aspect of that was that we were entitled to free rail passes, as well as all the air passes. Now, now almost no airline employees use their rail passes, because why, why should they when they could fly everywhere? Yeah. Um, I did, and one other person who had unfortunately seen uh, an air disaster and, and was reluctant to fly. Um, and the two memorable uh, trips were the one that I took on by rail were the one to Churchill and then the one through here. Yeah. And so uh, you actually witnessed an air disaster? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. All right. uh, well, I have, I have actually, but not, not an airline disaster. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that when you took <coughs> that that train ride from Edmonton to Prince Rupert, yep. you had no idea that this could possibly be somewhere where you spend the rest of your no, life? No, absolutely nothing. No. Um, essentially, I was interested in seeing Rupert and the coast and, and taking the ferry down, yeah. which I did. Yeah, so Prince George wasn't really on the radar? Not really, no. Just a pass. And it was a through. very uh, unmemorable stop here because um, uh, the the sector well first of all we the first adventure was the the bridge the railway bridge at Wobberman had burned down a few days before so they had to bus us from Edmonton to Wobberman and then they put us on the train to Jasper and then it got dark as we left Jasper so I missed all the Rockies oh, yeah. and uh, we were kind of trundling through the McGregor area just coming out of the mountains as, as it became dawn and and all you could see it was an overcast day and there were a lot of trees and no mountains and the river and uh, we pulled into Prince George it was still early in the morning it was a gray morning and you imagine you're walking I got up we had an hour or two stop and I got up and walked up and down First Avenue and it, it's not that pretty today it was <laughs> it was less so in those days <laughs> and there's the cut banks uh, which didn't impress me at the time they have since and yeah, but I, I had no idea I, c I could have no idea at that point that I would end up spending most of my life here yeah and you're lucky that that trip even came to fruition with the the burn down bridge and yeah. I mean you could have yeah. been doing a 180 at that point Absolutely. and heading back out east right yeah. Yeah. and and so the, your first impression with Prince George wasn't that memorable except except as we left the town um, in those days the uh, the train had one of these cars with uh, an open veranda on the back Nice. So I was standing in the veranda by myself at the back. Just open uh, air? Open air, yeah. Nice. A little gate around. Yeah. And as we were trundling through Myworth. And that's when the magic of the place and the Chaco River on one side and, yeah. and watching the tracks recede behind us going through Myworth, uh, which is a beautiful part of the city, by the it way. It really it's is. Just outside of the city. I would probably say it's the most underrated part of the city in terms of beauty and yeah. Wilkins I mean, Park area. Wilkins Park. Uh, yeah. I, I, I put up a, a little YouTube video on Wilkins the other day and, and it was a Sunday afternoon. It was a beautiful day like today yeah. and there was one other group there. That's Prince George. Vast picnic area yeah. and a beautiful river. And oh. yeah. <laughs> what a benefit to the community where you can actually go out to our world class parks yeah. and sometimes you're sharing them with one or two other people or even just yourself yeah. on a beautiful summer day. So that was the first spark of awareness really for me of, of hmm, th this looks like an interesting place. Yeah, and then so you officially moved here. But, but look, before we do that, we, okay. we have to move on that railway journey, yes, you're journey right. to yeah. Smithers because um, we had a four hour uh, stopover at Smithers and this was in May. And I got off the train and by now the weather was beautiful. It was just a, a bluebird day. And everything has got, you know, the fresh green of spring. Yeah, and the Hudson Valley. Bay Mountain. And then above is the, is the white glacier of Hudson Bay Mountain. And I just walked around the, the downtown of Smithers in a complete trance for two or three hours, yeah. just thinking, I've arrived in heaven. Paradise. Yeah. This, this is where I've got to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, uh, uh, when I took a job here, when I looked for work in, in northern BC, uh, Smithers was, was the place that I was aiming for. Where you wanted to be, yeah. 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 And Prince George, uh, when I finally found an opportunity here, was uh, second best, uh, closest I can get. In fact, one of my first outdoor trips was to Smithers and up onto the glacier. Nice. But um, since it wasn't too long before I realized that we actually have more here in Prince George than, than Smithers. And it I don't mean that in a detrimental way. Smithers is a great place. But when you add up everything that we have around here, 
you, when you start digging below the surface. Uh, and and this, this was before a lot of modern amenities uh, came to be in Prince George, like the university and so yeah. on. Smithers has a very aesthetic <coughs> competitive <coughs> advantage when you're in the town, because you can look around and see yep. absolute beauty kind of like staring down on you. Prince George, you just, you kind of have to drive or, or, you or look for leave it. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. you have to, to look for it. Which is why a lot of people, um, you know, who are passing through Prince George don't really see anything here. They see You're right. Uh, historically, it's a little different today. The city looks nicer now than it did. But, yeah. you know, 20, 30 years ago, you saw the industrial side of the city uh, if, if, you, if you just stayed for a day or two. You're right, Mike. I have some friends that work with WestJet, and their only exposure experience with Prince George is the airport coming down yep. the hill to downtown, staying at the Ramada, and doing a 180 and heading back to the airport. So they, the, with their impression of Prince George isn't really how it should right. be when you start exploring our parks within the region and then the surrounding vicinity, the, the absolute beauty that yep. exists very close by to yep. the community. Yep. So Smithers, and then you made your way to Rupert. Were you Rupert? impressed with Prince Rupert? I'm sorry? Were you impressed with Prince Rupert? Um, not particularly. Um, I, I don't mean that in a negative way. It just it didn't stand out. It was kind of what I expected. And yeah. I spent the night there and then caught the ferry down to uh, Kelsey Bay in Vancouver Island the next day. Wow. So you took the ferry <coughs> to Vancouver Island. Yeah. How long was that? It was an overnight. Yeah. Uh, and um, what was interesting about that ferry ride was uh, it, it was very early in the season. So there weren't too many people, passengers on board. There was a busload of uh, retirees, I think, on a tour, and one other couple. And um, I ended up sharing a car ride uh, with them down Vancouver Island nice. to Victoria. And um, yeah, I, uh, and I, I remember at one point I was standing on deck, and there was only me and one other person ever on deck. The, the, the retired group never came on deck, which was a shame, because it was a bluebird trip. Nice. And apparently it was the first sun they'd had in a month, so the, 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 the ship crew were busy painting everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm standing on deck, and I hear this rap, rap, rap. I look up behind me, and there's the captain on the bridge and beckoning me up, so Perfect. I spend an hour or two on the bridge and he was telling me about how some of the greenhorns who buy a boat on the coast and they don't understand the tides will tie it up and come back and find it hanging vertically. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that story. Nice. But, so, so that would have been in 1977. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, and then so the following year you end up in Prince George. Uh, I did. I was, um, uh, I, I, I should just say by the way, um, backing up a little bit again. I, I spent a year working for Sperry Univac, uh, uh, an American computer company, on, on the Air Canada Reservations uh, project in 1969. And at the end of that, as part of an agreement between the companies, I was one of 20 people who, out of 100, who transferred to Air Canada. So I worked in, in a technical capacity for Air Canada for eight and a half years or so until 1978. Yeah. And if you and weren't one of those 20 people, do you think you would have headed back to the UK? Who knows? Who yeah. knows? When when I set foot on uh, Canadian soil, I had two job offers on the first day. One was with the Toronto Stock Exchange, which I probably should have taken. Wow, interesting, <laughs> yeah. And the other was uh, with with uh, Sperry Univac on the Air Canada project, which I did take. And no, I, when I say should have, that's kind of <laughs> tongue in cheek. Uh, <laughs> that would have been a, a, a good career opportunity for sure. But mm -hmm. the Air Canada project was was absolutely fantastic. I mean, I I worked with. Uh, hundred people who had just come right off the Apollo Moon program. At one point I, I, I was discussing technical issues with one of the space shuttle engineers because they were using the same computer on From the NASA. space shuttle engines as we were on our network wow. and uh, neither one of us were able to compile programs and when we wanted to make a program change I had to put a programmer on a flight to Boston to make his change and then come back and test it in Toronto. Wow. So they had the same problem believe it or not so we were talking. And I was reading the article. Those are the kind of adventures we had. It was, yeah. it was quite something. Yeah, there is a study showing that, and it listed <coughs> the amount of people that it actually took to land on the moon. Oh. And it was over 300,000 yeah. people yeah. worldwide yeah. that were necessary for that shuttle to land on the moon. Yeah. Just a astonishingly Before high Before I left England, I took a computer course in London from the guy who wrote the technical specs for the zero-gravity commode on the Apollo moonship. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> How's that for a bit of trivia? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, that wasn't his specialty, but he was a he was a technical writer who was between projects. So they said, "Hey, we need somebody to write these specs up because yeah. we're ready to go." You know, that's the beautiful <laughs> thing about life. Like whatever yeah. vocation you choose, or or whatever your passions are, like how they just lead to different yep. things and different actions with people and and collaborating <coughs> together on, on projects. Yep. Like. We're, we're so lucky, we really are, to be gifted a life. Yeah. Like the, the actual probability <coughs> of living a human life is so slim. So the chance that we actually get to do this on yeah. the planet, it's remarkable. And, and you know, with the Air Canada project, uh, we were basically putting in a system that United Airlines had, had previously attempted to put in and failed. Um, and on the Air Canada project, we had, a, we had one guy who was absolutely brilliant. He's a, probably the most brilliant person I ever met. And, um, he went to management and says, I can make this work. And by making it work, they had to get 40,000 transactions per hour throughput, which was unheard of in those days for mm -hmm. a real-time system. And, and he was confident to make it happen? He was absolutely confident it could happen, and they turned him down flat. They, they, they weren't going to take the risk. There was a $40 million in 1969 dollars yeah. project. They weren't going to take the word of one guy, right? I mean, time value of money. <coughs> and so so of Air change. Canada in, in, in time and, and Sperry Univac went down the same path as United Airlines had gone. The thing was failing by more than 50%. They were only getting about 20,000 throughput. In the meantime, uh, this guy, Russell, had taken the operating system home and he worked on it every day at home on his own time. Wow. And then the 11th hour, he came in with a, a rewritten operating system and he said, let me demonstrate this. No, that's and dedication. He had, it. he had it and we had the project. Awesome. Accepted. Yeah. Uh, and that that's when it's no longer a career <coughs> for somebody, right? Yeah. It's, it's no longer a nine to five yeah. remuneration by the hour. It's your life. Yeah. And, and not a lot of people find that. There's, there, there are some people that find whatever their vision might be yeah. earlier on, and that's what they fall. They don't deviate from it their entire lives. Jim Good is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Knew what he wanted to do yeah. from a very young age and followed that passion relentlessly. Yeah. Followed his blessing, right? Yeah. And for me, um, the highlight in my career technically was, uh, it wasn't, wasn't that, I was on the sidelines of, of seeing this. Uh, although I spent an hour in an airplane circling over Chicago, unable to land with, with Russell, we were both going there on separate business. Yeah. And he pulled out the operating system and totally over my head and was just <laughs> explaining everything. You had that <laughs> extra hour just to, to talk about But for me, uh, the highlight for me was uh, I was in charge of writing the first software for the first Canadian uh, computer airline ticket printing. I still have the first Canadian airline ticket at home. It's still sitting at home. Yep. Wow. And, uh, in those days, that was a big deal because uh, when when an airline ticket was written, that was almost like it was negotiable. It was like like a, a money order. Yeah. Um, so uh, the technology uh, breakthrough we, we had w was um, essentially it was elect le electronic fund transfer technology in an age of freewheeling telecommunications, and and the challenge was huge. Yeah. Uh, they sent me down to Denver to visit United Airlines, who were the only other carrier who had done it so far down, and they were down in, in Denver, which was the IT headquarters. And uh, yeah, with all the mountains, right? Yeah, yeah. and they, they demonstrated, uh, the guy demonstrated it to me, and the, the very first demo out popped a dole ticket, which was the very thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he was mightily embarrassed. But but well, by the way, the best restaurant I ever ate at in my life was a place called the Hungry Dutchman in Denver. The Hungry Dutchman. Yep. I, I've I don't think it's still there, but I've actually heard about that through. I was reading a, it was a, a hockey autobiography from Ken Dryden, and so I think he mentioned it like when they're playing of in the AHL at the time. <coughs> they're they're in Colorado yep. and. I, I think he mentions that exact restaurant. Yeah, interesting. And yeah. and, and the, the guys at UAL had recommended it to us, so mm. uh, that's why we went there. And then the, the next day we took the rental car and we drove up to 11,000 feet in the Rockies just yeah. because we could. And uh, yeah. And then little did you know at the time that you'd be exploring much more of the, the northern version of those Rockies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in interested. So you arrive in Prince George in 1978. So, so you might be wondering, why would I give up that, that, that career? And uh, uh, other people did. But 
you know, eight years w was the right length of time for me. It was a 24-7 job before that term was invented. Yeah. And uh, it was starting to morph into something, you know, much more longer term and, and so on. So I, I was, uh, I'd been exploring uh, the Ontario outdoors, Algonquin Park primarily was most of what I did on other canoe trips. And I started looking for places north. And I initially, applied for a position in Fort McMurray with Great Canadian Oil Sands, one of the forerunners. Yeah. Of the, and uh, they turned me down initially because I didn't have a university degree. I'd spent a year at London University. Uh, and uh, But then they phoned me back a few days later and said, oh, we, see, uh, we see you went to the same school as our general manager and we'd like to offer you a job. And I turned them down. It just didn't seem right. Yeah. And I'm glad yeah. I did because uh, that would have led to a whole different life, whole different yeah. lifestyle, and yeah. you know, looking at, at Fort McMurray since, and I'm happy to be in Prince George. Yeah. So, were you? Did you already meet your wife at this time? And like when you, my I, I, my present wife is uh, a second marriage. Okay. And, and uh, we've been married for tw nearly 20 years. Okay. So you met her in, in Prince George. In Prince George. Yes. Great. Yeah. Excellent. And so I look at your past career, and you, we already mentioned all the travel that was associated with it which which can be hard on a person but also an ability to see so many different parts yeah. of the world yeah. you know, see so many different parts of north america i didn't see as much as, as i might have as an airline employee because in those days uh, canada's network was uh, fairly constrained between london england or well, out to moscow as well and and uh, the west coast of north america mm. and in those days before deregulation canadian pacific had had the rest of the world yeah. So we were somewhat limited. I, you know, I, I went back to the UK a number of times. Uh, yeah. Were those the only two players in the game, like in oligopoly? Were it was those two airlines, or were there several? There were some. Well? There were there were uh, a few charter companies, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but but yeah, it was it was quite different in the in before deregulation. Yeah, you look at so Air Canada I, now, and. They're looked up to on a global level oh, yeah, as a yeah. very admirable yeah. company and airline. It's a totally different company today, but I still have some residual loyalty to them. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. All but right. Uh, so I, I want to talk the Caribbean. I got. I got. Uh, I spent some time in the Caribbean and, and North America and, nice. and Europe. Where about in the Caribbean? Barbados mainly. Yeah. Uh, Antigua. Yeah. Um, That's my parents actually are from the UK as well. They're from Dundee, Scotland, and in their 20s, they decided to move to Jamaica, out of all places. Oh, right. <laughs> and I, I guess Jamaica would, would have been part of the Commonwealth. And so during the 70s, they went and lived in Jamaica for a few years. And after that, they're kind of thinking about what their next move should be. And they ended up coming to Prince George. But the job offer, it was from a, a company <coughs> that the meetings were in Vancouver. And so they told my dad, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, it's just north of Vancouver <laughs> where you're going to yeah. arrive. And little did they know that it would be in Prince George, eight hour drive north of Vancouver, where back then, and you can attest to this because you arrived in Prince George in 1978, winters were a little bit different then. Can you explain the first winter you Well, the guy who hired me to come here was a guy named Paul Mignot, who was the coach for the Spruce Kings. Nice. Uh, yeah. He was also the um, Secretary of Treasurer for the school board. And uh, so I was hired by the school board as the data processing manager. And um, uh, when I was interviewed in Toronto by Paul, um, he explained the Prince George winters. He says that the snow is so light and fluffy, all you need is a broom. <laughs> 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 well, that first winter, 1978, uh, everybody uh, shoveled the roofs of their houses at least once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very, very heavy snow winter. Yeah, but it and was a dry snow. He was right in that sense. It mm -hmm. wasn't quite the the fluffy broom uh, flicking <laughs> snow that that he sold, but. Uh, and not just those substantial levels of of snow, but also the temperatures. Like that's when it used to be minus mi 40 was. Yeah. Uh, Typical for two weeks in yeah. January. You could you could depend on it. And uh, the coldest temperature I, I've ever experienced was in Moores Meadow Park at minus 50. Wow. Uh, and now we used to there, there used to be minus 50 temperatures in Prince George. You talk to old timers. Um, yeah. If I'm not one of those <laughs> now, but um, you know people who lived here in the 50s and, and earlier, you know, minus 50 was not uncommon. But it was by uh, 1978. But uh, on one occasion. Um, 
the temp my temperature was registering 39 at the house. We live near Moore's Meadow. Yeah. So I took I took an accurate snow thermometer and I said I'm going to see what it's like with cold air pooling. So mm -hmm. I walked down to the bottom of Moore's Meadow minus 50. Unreal. Yeah. And you know you hear these stories of of folklore from from people that have called Prince George their whole life and it doesn't even feel like folklore when they're saying like they remember minus 45 more minus 46 yep. temperatures you believe them because yep. you know those are the the temperatures that it used to get to it was sure. dependable every year for at least my first 10 years yeah, yeah. and Moore's Meadow is so unique because even like present day you can be going for a walk with your dogs or a run and as soon as you get into the meadow you feel it drop a, a couple of degrees yeah. in, in temperature yeah yeah, oh, and what a beautiful place. So, part. if anybody ever wants to experience, uh, you know, super cold, that's the place to go. Uh, you know, pick a day when it, when it's as cold as it's going to be. I think we we hit close to minus forty briefly. Uh, yeah, yeah. January, this winter, so. where you s saw all the online videos going up, where people were doing the boiling water yeah. and they'd throw it up into there, and it yeah. just crystallized. Very cool. So, when did you? I have to ask, when did you get into writing? Because like reading your books the way you can articulate your experiences with the outdoors and, and the way you can just describe things. It, you, you get lost in the books. Like as a reader of your books, like I actually feel like I'm hiking Fang Mountain or I actually feel like I'm with you going through the meadows at, at Viking Ridge. When did you really find your, your passion and realize you're a good writer? When did I start? Yeah. Uh, as, a te as a teenager yeah. in, in the UK. Uh, I wrote a series of letters to the uh, local newspaper, the Leicester Mercury, and um, actually it was on UFOs, and uh, I was basically rebutting. <laughs> UFOs were big in the news at that time, so I, I wrote a, a strong rebuttal letter, and that caused a storm of response <laughs> <laughs> from all the UFO uh, folks. And uh, you get so some then, strong believers, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And so then I then they let me uh, write a follow up letter. So my first two published works were, were in the Leicester Mercury way back. Yeah, your first and two of over 540? 540, 540 now? odd. Um, yeah. I kept rough, rough track. It's yeah. out of interest. And uh, so in your teens, it started. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But then um, even working for Air Canada doing technical writing, um, I, I actually enjoyed uh, doing technical writing. At one point, I spent a month on a very tracking down a very, very obscure problem that was crashing the system. You know, every few months, it wasn't a big deal, but it w it had to be found. And it took me a month to find it. I, I had to keep putting traps in, and then another trap deeper than that. I finally found it. And it was just one of those light bulb eureka moments, and I, I was you know just so f so on top of this thing that I, I had to I had to write. <laughs> about a 10-page report on it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't know whether anybody ever read it, but I enjoyed writing it. Yeah, so your writing technique, are, are you putting pen to paper, or, or were you on typewriter then, and are you on computer um, now? Really, uh, when I started writing um, uh, more steadily, it was with the early computers, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, did you know that from a young age <coughs> that one day you'd be writing your own books? No, not really. Um, but um, I, it, it really started for me with uh, the Federation of Mountain Clubs, which is a federation of, of uh, outdoor clubs. The Caledonia Ramblers yep. locally is a member, as are other local clubs, such as in the Robson Valley. So is that international or Canadian? No, it's, it's British Columbia. Brit oh, BC yeah, based. Federation okay. of Mountain Clubs of BC. Oh, okay. So they have long had a, a newsletter called Cloudburst. That's and right. And uh, so I wrote a piece for Cloudburst on I can still remember the title. It was called The Ethics of Indiscriminate Can Building. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were building cans, you know, all over the place for, mm -hmm. for no good reason. So, And it became a thing later with the parks, <laughs> national parks. Um, and uh, then I thought, I've got an, something else I'd like to write about. And at that point, I thought, well, I've got two topics, you know, two things I want to write about. And one thing led to another, and I ended up writing a 10-year column for for Cloudburst. Uh, it was called Northern Perspective because nobody was writing from the north. Mm -hmm. And um, that led then into a column I wrote for Prince George this week, which was the weekly uh, free offshoot of the citizen. Yeah, that's right, yeah, they're, they're one of their subsidiaries. Yeah. I think they originally created it to, as a counter to the free press. Yeah, it because it was a free publication as yeah. well, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so uh, Prince George this week was looking for community writers, and um, I had an opportunity to, I wrote a two or three pieces for them. And I, again, I thought, well, I've got 
maybe three or four that I could write, but <laughs> and it became a weekly uh, column again for 10 years. The first couple of years weren't weekly, but uh, after that I was writing a weekly column and um, I still got them all and maybe I should put them in a book one day, but I think that would be a great idea. Also another fantastic idea would be an audio book. Uh, if, if you ever wanted to turn one of your physical books and, and narrate it yourself because audiobooks have just exploded in popularity. They have, haven't they? Yeah. 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 yeah and lots of people listen to them on their commute to work. They'll yeah. listen to them when they're working out at the gym. And some of them uh, crank up the speed. Yeah, That's you can, thing now yeah. You can listen he, to them. At, at he, almost like the Alvin and the Chipmunks voice yeah, comes in, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, so when did you start writing about your hikes then? Did you start did, like, kind of documenting them as you went and like, have a journal or did you just kind of write and illustrate them? Well, um, the, the, um, yeah, the, the uh, uh, Prince George uh, this, this week column, um, what did I call it? Outdoors Prin Prince George, I mm -hmm. think. Um, it, it was just a, an outlet for what I was doing, but, but gradually it, it broadened into all kinds of topics. And, and uh, at one point, you know, I was convinced the editor wasn't reading anything I wrote, and, and I, you know, I, <laughs> I had a name there now, and that they would just print whatever I wrote. And by and large, that was the case. So I got to uh, broaden the, the, f the field way beyond uh, just the outdoors and to yeah. science and technology and whatever else caught my interest. Nice uh, to have that creative freedom. Yeah, right? and I've always had an interest in astronomy and cosmology, so I did a bit on that. I wrote a, I wrote a epitaph for uh, Sir Fred Hoyle when he died, the famous British cosmologist who coined the Big Bang yeah. <laughs> yeah. phrase. One of the most popular like theories in, in our time, yeah. yeah. I, I even fantasized writing something absolutely outrageous just to see if the editor was reading. <laughs> <laughs> just never promoting the free press throughout <laughs> the article, a eh? great yeah. weekly publication. Uh, and so that, uh, it was that column in Prince George this week that led to the first book, Exploring Prince George. And so uh, my thought was that, okay, I've got this column. All I've, all I've got to do is put it into a book. That should be easy enough, right? Wrong. <laughs> Uh, it, in my opinion, if you've got a lot of things that you've written for, for another venue, so, such as a newspaper, um, a book is quite a different uh, format. And Because mm -hmm. um, you've self-published as well as worked with publishers. I, I have, yeah. The first book, though, was, was uh, um, Exploring Prince George. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so the initial thought was I'm, I'm going to take all of these columns, or many of them, and put them into a book. Yeah, and in fact, a lot of the content in that book came from columns, but it proved to be a much more difficult task uh, than I thought. And everything had to be re rewritten, reorganized. And in retrospect, it would have been easier starting from scratch. Um, but that was the genesis of it. And um, prior to that book, actually, I, I started writing the Evanoff book uh, before the Exploring Prince George, um, because George. Uh, we may get to talk about this, I don't know, but, but uh, George uh, was killed in 1998. And um, I was, uh, he and I had discussed doing a book about him um, literally two weeks before he died. Um, and um, of course, it became quite a different project. Instead of me ghostwriting his, his uh, biography, uh, I had to do all the research. Yeah, um, and George Evanoff, who there is a provincial park <coughs> named after him, and also park, yes. he was uh, a staple in so many local trails, including LC Gun, which was named yes. after, I believe, an employee at the Grand Trunk Pacific. Uh, he, he was a surveyor. Oh, okay, yeah. a surveyor. Yeah. Uh, but he was instrumental in creating that, yeah. that local park. But how did George Evanoff pass on uh, for our listeners and watchers who might yeah, not would, know. Uh, George uh, had the misfortune of, of walking into into a moose that had been killed by a grizzly bear on, on the Bearpaw Ridge, aptly named, um, east of Prince George, just across from uh, north of Sugar Bowl Grizzly Den Park. <coughs> and um, yeah, he, he was uh, attacked and killed by the bear. Uh, a bear defending a, a carcass is, is uh, actually a more dangerous situation than a, than a, a bear with cubs. And uh, if you're ever near a carcass in the backcountry, just get the heck away from it. No, you know, just just get out of there. Um, so when did you find out the news? Because I know George is a great friend of yours. Yeah, well, I was um, 
I, I got a phone call. I, I was actually hiking on Viking Ridge just across the trench at the time it happened. Same day. Same day. In fact, you know, if one of us had phoned the other, we probably would have gone together and I probably would have gone with him because that's how it went. Um, and uh, when I got home from my hike, uh, I got a phone call from Dave King and saying that George was missing. And uh, so uh, we didn't get a search going right away because that was his wish. He'd expressed in very strong terms that, that an outdoors person you know, ought to be able to take care of themselves for at least a day. And he'd made it very clear he didn't want you know, a big search if he was ever overdue, um, at least for the first day. And his, his wife was adamant to that effect as well. So we, we spent a long evening. Uh, we developed contingency plans um, uh, for a small number of his friends to go out there. It didn't include me because I, I was already done from a mountain hike that day already. So I did a lot of the organizing in town. And um, uh, we did one thing that was right. Uh, without making it official, to make a search official, you've got to go through the RCMP, basically, essentially, the local police. Uh, but we did notify the search and rescue group because many of them knew George and we knew them, mm -hmm. and I had some history there as well. And um, as, it, as it was, they were doing an exercise that night, so they switched their exercise to preparing just in case. So they were ready to go, actually. And then Dave King led a small group <coughs> of two or three people in that night by headlamp, and uh, it, it was late that night, around midnight, that they radioed back to me saying that they had found, you know, lots of bear sign. And given George and who he was, it was it was fairly evident that, um, you know, if anybody had been able to help himself, and we had a radio with him, and um, so it didn't look good at that point. So mm -hmm. at that point, I made the 911 call, and we made it official. And the SAR group was all set to go anyway, so we all went out there the next morning. Yeah. <coughs> and you went with search and rescue the next morning? Yeah. 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 And I actually was a team leader of the team that found the site. I, I didn't find his body because um, we immediately backed away. Um, when we, I, I literally walked on the moose kill. I was as close as I am to you from the moose kill. <coughs> so we backed away and circled around, found, found his tracks and their tracks. and. We had no radio contact. Uh, the old handheld radio's uh, line of sight didn't work very well, but we got enough of a message out to attract the attention of them to send a helicopter, and then the helicopter hovered over us, <coughs> and the RCMP and others homed in on the helicopter, and, and they, were, they were armed. Shots were fired. It got very tense. Yeah, and, and uh, so the bear was still there. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> the bear was never, was never destroyed, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which was the will of the family. And there was no reason to it. Was it wasn't that type of an attack? Yeah. It's just misfortune. Yeah. But well, um, so the book became uh, quite a different thing. And I I did the initial writing right away. It was uh, quite emotional, obviously. And then I had to put it aside. Yeah. And, and I mean, this book is is I just purchased it this morning, and I'm I'm so excited to to read it. And uh, George Evanoff, and you know, the mountain <coughs> knows no expert which is the, the name of the book. Can you determine why you chose yeah, that well title? Yeah, well, George was best known locally for his work with Aval Avalanche. And, and by the way, I, I should mention that the point of the book w was not to highlight what happened to him. To him. Um, the book, as he and I discussed it uh, uh, two weeks earlier, was uh, that, that he had a story to tell, that, that he, he was an inspiration individual. and, and uh, it was a very private individual, and, and I didn't think he would agree to a book, but he agreed to it on the basis that, that it, it would help inspire others to enjoy the outdoors as he had. Absolutely. And that fact, and coupled with just <coughs> telling this remarkable human being story, yeah. I, f I feel it's so important. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps after you've read the book, uh, you, you could do something on that, uh, you know, in, in memory of the, of the guy. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And, and we're, we're in the end of the Coast Inn of the North Hotel, and down in the lobby still to this day is the George Evanoff Room. There's Evanoff Provincial Park, and there's a plaque on, on the gun trail, as you mentioned. Yeah, and when you see those things around the community, you, you know it's coming from a person of, of inspiration. Yeah. And, and George, 
a friend of yours. What, was he instrumental in the commencement of the Caledonia Ramblers? No. Okay, no, so he, not he came along later. Came along. And neither was Dave King either. Uh, D Dave came a little bit later, and, and uh, I forget the, the original people. I mean, Dave was there shortly afterwards, and then yeah. I arrived in 1978. I actually spent my first uh, summer here. Just I bought the guidebook from the hiking club and basically yeah. did all the stuff on my own. And, and that came out every person. year, correct? It, well, more there. or less, every, every year, year or every two years. So it was always up to date. Yeah. And when you say guidebook, what did that look like back then? Originally, it was a, a, a yellow paper, soft-covered right. book. Uh, nowadays, it has a color cover, and it's in two volumes, one for the Robson Valley and one for him. Yeah. But, but backing up a little bit, um, you asked me about the, the title of the book. Correct. Uh, and where that came from, the mountain knows no expert. And, and the big thing that George brought to this area was his avalanche knowledge. And um, there's no doubt in my mind that, that he saved you know, some lives with the knowledge that he passed on. But of course, you never hear about the people who don't die in an avalanche. Um, but he, uh, he was instrumental in delivering avalanche safety training. Uh, it was how I first met him. It was on an avalanche course at Grizzly Den in, in 19, 1979, I believe. Um, and um, there was a famous saying in the avalanche world uh, by uh, the director of the Swiss Snow and Avalanche in Institute. Uh, and it, it, the saying was, remember, remember, my friend, the avalanche does not know that you are an expert. And this was one of George's favorite sayings. And you know he absolutely didn't ever like to be called an expert, even though he, he clearly was. And so that's how that title came to be in the book. And uh, it was uh, book titles, when you go with a publisher, uh, are always a negotiation in, in terms, and the book covers as well, because they've got marketing in mind and so on. So the title that evolved there was as a result of negotiation with the publisher. Yeah. Well, if there's one passion that I, I feel George and you share, it's offering proactive solutions to outdoor recreational safety. And, yes. and you also have a, a book, Outdoor Safety and Survival. Was, has this always been a, a something you've been passionate about, is to, to be able to make sure that other people are prepared when they're heading into the wilderness to, so they don't get caught off guard if they're in an unfortunate situation, whether it's an injury or getting lost or something like an avalanche yeah. if it's winter? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it, it began for me right after I arrived in Prince George, uh, so 43 years ago. I, um, I ch actually uh, took a hunter uh, training course, uh, the core course as it was known then, uh, which you need in order to, to get a hunting license mm. and, and, uh, and so on. And uh, during the course of, of that, uh, I met a number of individuals who were members of the Prince George Search and Rescue Group. And that group was still in its infancy. It, it, it was only formed, I think, in 1974 in the aftermath of the tragedy, tragedy on the Willow River That's when right. eight yeah. teenage boys were killed. Yeah. And they were dropped off at the wrong highway bridge, as I understand it, on the Willow and found themselves in an impassable canyon. In mm -hmm. those days, there was no rescue group in Prince George. Um, obviously, there were, there were fire and police and so on. And so the authorities asked for volunteers and people who had any kind of outdoor skills or climbing skills, because this was a canyon. And yeah. they, had to they dropped ropes into it. It really was a desperate plea for help. It was, it was desperate. They, they yeah. never, ever found a single body, yeah. um, as I understand it. Uh, so that was the, the start of the Prince George Re uh, Search and Rescue Group, and it was only four or five years old when I arrived here. And and and, uh, and you joined met, right away. Well, I met some members through my uh, core yeah. course that I took, yeah. and then it was later in that year that I signed up as a as a trainee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with them for five years as a volunteer. I uh, uh, moved up to team leader, and then for my last year or two, I was. Uh, I had a group, they called it Rescue Chief in those days, which was a grand title, really. It would just be chair. <laughs> Sounds pretty cool to me. <laughs> yeah, it was a cool title, yeah. I but uh, th that was a, a, a good five years. And, and um, you know, it's it said that, uh, particularly among teachers, that, that one of the greatest rewards in life is, is when you, you see the outcome. Um, I was listening to your interview with, with the... Um, with Jerry Chidia? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and, and, the, and the guy from the heart. Um, from the, the heart? Yeah, the, the uh, 
principal from the hot. Oh, uh, Don Chamberlain. Don yeah, Chamberlain. Yeah, from Kelly Road. Yeah. Great, great human being. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I had that experience a bit in, in a sense that one of the one of the teenagers who I was instructing with went during my time then and one, then went on to spend his, most of his life with search and rescue provincially and became very involved. And I know, I know that that first introductory those first introductory sessions that we did were, were you know, instrumental in yeah, that. Yeah, profoundly so, helpful. Yeah. I've always felt that uh, when you look at SAR, search and rescue organizations, not just in Prince George, but throughout the nation and, and globally, really, it, they're very underappreciated. Yeah. And because it's not just, uh, <coughs> you're not just putting in, say, a, a four hour volunteer shift every Saturday. Like, you're pretty much always susceptible to getting a phone call yeah. or a notification yeah. saying, we need help. Yeah, uh, and usually when it's least convenient. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I eventually dropped out after five years because uh, it, of work conflicts. It, it, it was it was difficult to maintain, you know, just dropping everything at work on a, at a moment's notice, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to be part of it if I couldn't fully participate. So yeah. I reached the point after five years, and in those days, the Prince George Group wasn't that busy. We I probably was involved in about a dozen operational searches and, and many many training sessions, obviously, but. Um, you look at the people in the Lower Mainland, especially now with North Shore Rescue, who are, are called out multiple times on a weekend. Um, I mean, that is a huge, huge commitment. Yeah, yeah. Those Pacific Coast Mountains too. I mean, there's some depth to those, right? And, yeah. and uh, you look at some of these online <coughs> Facebook <coughs> groups that have really manifested throughout the years, and hike in British Columbia, or even our own Prince George area and hiking group, where they've exploded in popularity. And the one great thing I see on these groups are these proactive solutions of people going in yep. there and saying, just a friendly reminder, everyone, if you're heading out, backpacking, hiking, camping this weekend, like here's a safety yep. list of tips and, and strategies yep. to avoid, proactive solutions to avoid unfortunate circumstances. And it's nice to see those kind of... Yeah, and you know, one of the biggest killers of all is complacency. And, and mm -hmm. <laughs> the longer you've been in it and the more experienced you are, the more susceptible you are to that. And yeah. uh, you know, we, we see that in industry as well as in the outdoors. Yeah. So Even um, as something as simple as hydration, <coughs> right? It, yeah. I mean, you should always be finishing one of your adventures with some leftover fluid. Yeah. Like, you should never want to run out at a certain and, point. And you should always, always be prepared to spend an overnight. Yeah, out. that's and, the biggest and that, one. And that came, uh, came home to me a couple of years ago. I was uh, doing the, uh, the Brazzer Loop in Jasper National, South Jas Jasper National Park. And uh, I had to turn back on that occasion because the the first time I turned that, the second time I went ahead. But the, in the meantime, there'd been this huge washout came down uh, uh, Nigel Creek from Nigel Pass, and it completely took out a bridge, which wasn't a big deal, you could afford it. But um, <coughs> there was a young couple who had just gone in for a day hike, mm -hmm. and they were within sight of the highway, the, the, the Iseo Parkway, and they came back, and there's this huge debris torrent going by. There's no way they could have crossed it uh, safely, they would have been killed. Yeah. So they had to spend the night there, within sight of the highway. Yeah, they had a cold, uncomfortable night, but they they had enough stuff with them. So, and these you know, happen; they're ubiquitous throughout yeah, the province. It, you don't know when that's yeah. going to happen to you. I mean, uh, or what could cause it? You you could uh, twist an ankle, break a leg, or you, your partner might, or mm -hmm. somebody something might happen to something else. You might have a bear encounter that turns you around, and uh, you have to go back another way. Any number of things. So, you know, just carry enough stuff with you to be able to spend at least one night out and that means uh, staying dry that's that's the best thing you can do for yourself because getting wet is is a, is a fast way to hypothermia mm -hmm. and having some spare clothing with you so you know these people i see hiking the mountains with these little micro packs and mountain running is a big thing these days yeah okay fine as long as you've got some supports uh, but um, you need to have a decent sized pack with, with some clothing that's, that's uh, going to keep you alive at least uh, through a cold night. And uh, you know, typically the mountains, the, the nights can go below freezing any time of the year. And they're beautiful, but they can be unforgiven, yeah. right? And yeah. nature is always in control. Yeah. As much as we'd like to think that you know, we're, we're prepared and we got this, Mother Nature is always going to be in control. Yeah. I look at, my girlfriend and I just did a hike up Mount Murray beautiful and I, I know you actually recognize it as one of your favorite hikes in your book 
More than that, it's uh, th this is my Mount Murray in the Pine Pass. Yeah, that yeah. that that trail was my trail. I I originated. That's that trail. right. <laughs> yes, yeah. I remember even telling Sandra, I was like, you know, like Mike Nash is the one yeah. of the. I, I this bushwhacked trail. up there in 1983 for mm -hmm. the first time. Realized, hey, this is a fabulous area. Before that, we had a trail a little bit close to the Azazetta Lake. Yes, that's was, right. Which yeah. was much more rugged. Yeah, and got off on sort of different ridge but but this got you right to the summit and it, it was an easy route once you got past this nasty little uh cut bank yeah start above the railway tracks yeah. and so i bushwhacked up there and then i went back with george evanoff and the two of us cut a trail halfway up yeah unofficially it wasn't a park then um and then the hiking club caledonia ramblers came in and, and fully built the trail later and then number of years after that it, it became a provincial park mount lamori provincial mm -hmm. park came out of the protected area strategy in the 1990s you must look back at that that one hike you did with george evanoff and just smile of those memories of the two of you i don't know if anybody else was with you but just like that experience of being with george and you know trailblazing through this yep. semi unknown area and pr probably getting up to the, the Alpine Lakes and and just looking in awe. Well, that was one. That was one occasion when he was kind of following my route. Usually, I was following his route. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, all of the trails into Fang were his uh, idea. The, the trail up to Fang Caves. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole Fang Cave discovery came from George. From George. You know, I just had some some friends that did fang mountain last weekend and actually uh kendall kershaw who i'm i'm gonna gift this book to because okay. i just ordered the other one and her and her partner tyler have really gone into hiking and they're you can you can just see the passion that they have for it but also the fact that fang mountain has to be one of the most gorgeous hikes in the world yeah. it, it really does and there's another of there, there's another example <coughs> of you could start at the base of Fang Mountain or at really any mountain and it could be a 35 degree day and you're in a tank top and shorts and and feeling really nice and toasty but you can get to the top and all of a sudden you're putting on toques and and more layers of clothing if like weather can change like that yeah. and the one area I noticed the most was actually Mount Murray mm -hmm. uh, in the Pine Pass <coughs> where you start on a hot summer day but by the top with the winds you can be layering on those clothes quite quickly and um, on one occasion i recall we had an over overnight camp at mount murray uh, actually i think it was a club trip so there were quite a few people there the next morning we woke up it was so fogged in it was a pea super you literally couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of you yeah so it was uh, it's hard to believe uh, that you would have a, a problem finding your way out of that area but it there was some serious navigation <laughs> required <laughs> yeah so there's another thing yeah. um be prepared i mean never ever go out without a compass yeah. And I don't care what technology you've got with you. Yeah. No, and, and, and you don't even have to have a map. I mean, that's good to have as well. But a compass by itself is still very valuable. It, can, it will enable you to walk in a, in a straight line at least. It's so easy to walk in circles. And um, if you've got some idea of where you are, then you, you can aim for a highway or, or something. Yeah. I, I went out and I, I bought 10 compasses online and I gave them to all my hiking friends just saying and they have a little clip on your your backpack yep. just said just put it on there you might not use it for the next 10 hikes but you never know that one time where but, you, you but might learn how to use it don't just yes. carry it yeah I mean <laughs> yeah exactly I so <clears throat> we've, we've talked a lot about George but I also want to have a conversation about another good friend of yours and that is Dave King yes. because when we first established dialogue via email Mike you recommended to have Dave on that's the right. podcast. That, that's uh, how I happen to be here is because I recommended you interview Dave. Yeah, and, and we still <coughs> want to make that happen. <coughs> yeah. And, but I, I read all the articles that you sent about Dave and I, I know that there's a mini biography about him in your book. Talk about a fascinating individual that's seen so much of the world from East Africa to the Himalayas to, to this region alone. How, when did you meet first Dave, or first meet Dave and when did you realize that this person is unique? Um, I, I first encountered Dave. I didn't meet him on this occasion. Uh, my first uh, few weeks in Prince George, it was spring of 1978, and I attended an event at the Civic Center, which was put on by the hiking club, and, which I wasn't a member of. But And there was Dave King on, on the stage, looking very much then as he does today, 43 <laughs> years later. And tall. Extolling <laughs> the virtues of the area in the mountains and showing slides. Yeah, 35 millimeter slides. <clears throat> so that was my first encounter with Dave. And uh, 
uh, basically got to know him gradually over a few years. I don't think there was any, any particular sudden event. And I think it was me that kind of introduced Dave and George, and then they became very, very much involved in trail building and, and other stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and some of the trails that, that Dave built, <coughs> Viking Ridge, correct? Uh, Viking Ridge, uh, he, he didn't build the original Sugar Bowl Trail. That mm. was built by, actually, the Naturalist Club was the instigator originally of the Sugar Bowl Trail. Oh, okay. And then um, the connector? Uh, what Dave did was uh, he, first of all, relocated the Sugar Bowl Trail, which was much more, it ran, ran up the side of the avalanche path originally. Oh, so okay. So he relocated it to where it is today. Yeah. And then he conceived the idea of the Viking Ridge Trail, which he, he uh, laid out and built. Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> the idea was to link <coughs> Viking Trail and the Sugar Bowl Trail across the front ridge. Yeah. And uh, I was on the trip when we actually built that trail, which was hilarious because um, we actually built that trail. We were a strong group, about as fast as you could hike it today. Mm -hmm. um, because we had different people doing different things. And I was, uh, my original task was to go ahead and mark the route, pick a route and mark it and hang some tape. And then the chainsaw crew came behind and then the people with brushing axes and then the people picking up and then the people nailing up signs at the back. You very know, efficient. Was, oh, very efficient, yeah. yeah. About maybe 15 people. And um, except the only problem was um, I'm, I've been designated to pick the route, but right behind me is George and Dave, and they've both each got their own idea, <laughs> probably <laughs> better than mine, because they were both more experienced at route finding. And <clears throat> so I'm picking one route, and jo George is hanging tape over here, and Dave's hanging tape over there. Finally, I said, I'm going to the back of the line. <laughs> you guys pick the route. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but that was, experience, though, that was the a nice three day. of you guys, along with a, a great supporting cast, but yep. you, you just have to reflect on these memories, Mike, and, and picture Dave there with George, and you're in your element. You yep. know, you're, you're in the middle of nature, less than 50 minutes east of Prince George, and Creighton, which would eventually become one of the more popular hiking trails of the region that both residents and visitors of the Prince George area love to gravitate towards. And yeah. you must look back at that with joy. Well, you know, the, 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 um, the Viking Sugar Bowl area, which later became part of the Sugar Bowl Grizzly Den mm -hmm. Park, and, um, and also part of the Grand Canyon, which, w which was one of the things that I was able to achieve. Was, was yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay, well, the Grand Canyon. Uh, I started exploring it uh, after I kept noticing a car parked by the side of the highway, and I eventually found out it belonged to a guy named Joe Plank, who was a ski patroller apparently at Purden, and he would got interested in the Grand Canyon, found a way in there, done a lot of trail clearing, and he never really talked about it much, but he was just in there every week. Yeah. So I, I finally decided I was going to go in there, and, and my route in was a bit different. I, I skied up, up uh, uh, Kenneth Creek, which flows into Sugar Bowl Creek and then into the Fraser. Okay. And, and so is this north of Highway 16? Yeah. Th yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, long story short, I made my way to the Fraser River and I skied all the way up to the canyon and, and uh, back again. And didn't go through the ice and it was nearly dark by the time I got out and I bushwhacked out and hit this lovely uh, glade of uh, black spruce. Uh, so I, I lucked out and it, it was a wonderful day. And then I started going in there, and later I, I started leading hiking club trips in there. And then I went to the Ministry of Forests Recreation Officer. They were responsible to four sites and trails BC for that sort of thing. And I said, you know, there's something really special here, and I knew something of the history by then that Jack Boudreau later wrote about. And um, so the guy said, well, all right, I'll, we'll have a look at it. So a few months later, I ran into the guy, and I said, have you had a look at the Grand Canyon yet? And he said, well, I said, my, uh, my summer student went there and had a look at it. He said, there's nothing there. And that got my goat big time. There's the, all the motivation you need right That's there. all the motivation you need. I went home and I wrote a proposal for a provincial park, <laughs> well, for a protected area or whatever. Yeah. And I submitted it to the regional director of BC Parks. And within days, I got a reply back saying, we have put a UREP reserve on the Grand Canyon, which stands for Use, Recreation, and Enjoyment of the Public. That's right. Which yeah. wasn't any kind of protection, but what it did mean was that any agency that wanted to do anything there now had to refer to BC Parks. Yeah, it's an important acronym to have associated with the area. So, it w that was the first step. And, and then uh, came along the Prince George Land and Resource Management Plan, 
It's a whole other story we probably won't have time, won't have time to get into. But arising out of our membership in, in the Prince George uh, Land and Resource Management Plan that was going to resolve a lot of land use issues in this area, we were suddenly directed to recommend the protected areas. So, I mean, this fell into our lap, the opportunity to recommend. We took the protected areas from half a percent to, to nearly seven and a half percent in the Prince George area. That's a lot. Uh, an area the size of Switzerland, we, we got to protect, you know, seven and a half percent of it. Yeah. Um, Does that include our interior rainforest out yeah. east? Well, yeah. it didn't in those days. No, the ancient forest came later. That wasn't part of it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Shukabal Grizzly Dam became part of it. Kakwa became came out yeah. of that, so, and a lot of other things. And uh, because I had done that initial work, I had the opportunity to put the Grand Canyon on the table. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and initially, the Sugar Bowl Grizzly Den Park was going to stop, uh, was going to come over from Raven Lake and then stop at the Alpine above Highway 16 so they could log the whole slope. Oh, wow. Um, nothing wrong with logging, by the way, but it didn't make sense mm -hmm. to have a big park that stopped at the Alpine. Yeah. And um, I remember one evening I made this impassioned plea to the, to the planning group, and it's the one time in my life I, I just felt the passion and I could feel the audience uh, uh, soaking it up. And basically I appealed you know, for them to bring the boundary down to the highway. And then the government went one step further and they said, well, we'll take it all the way to the Fraser River. Nice. <coughs> so that's how the park, uh, and that connected it with the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Yeah. which was, th to that point, going to be a separate small park, special feature park. Doesn't get any more rewarding than that, no. right? Uh, fantastic. And, you know, so we have this, this uh, it's an overused phrase, but beautiful world-class park where th that has two highway accessible, year-round highway accessible trailheads, uh, less than an hour from Prince George. Yeah. That's a, on, on an easy driving open highway. Yeah. So. If you were to access the Grand Canyon, you do it north of Highway 16, yes. or would, is there an opportunity to head through like uh, Longworth and Penny in that area? Only by river. Only by river, yeah. okay, so that's and, not And I've, I've, I've been to the Grand Canyon three times by riverboats, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people have died in the canyon historically, so yeah. it's not to be toyed with, but yeah. um, to access it by land, the easiest way is in the winter, um, on snowshoes, uh, probably these days. Yeah. Um, and, and, and not to be confused with the, the Fort George Canyon no, either, because no. a lot of our, our listeners or watchers might think that's what we're referencing. The Fraser right. Grand Canyon is, has a huge amount of history. And the best thing I can do is, is refer people to Jack Boudreaux's book mm -hmm. on, on the canyons, um, yeah. which covers the Fort George Canyon as well, but yeah. a lot of the history of the Grand Canyon. It, it really makes you have respect for all these yeah. people in the early 1900s that were the actually <laughs> the early 20th century the nobody knows how many but uh, likely around 200 people died in the Grand Canyon because yeah. they were bringing scows down from the, the railhead yeah. to what is today Fort George yeah um, yeah I, I in back in <coughs> 2017 uh, Andrew our our podcast producer recorder and I along with a couple individuals we were able to go up in one of Aberdeen helicopters okay. and we went down the Grand Canyon it felt like we're on some kind of Hawaiian tropical island or, or something it just yeah. felt amazing yeah. and we actually got down into the canyon in the helicopter and we're kind of just like cruising on on top of <coughs> of the Fraser River and then after that we came up and then we went over top of, of Purden and Fang yep. Mountain and yep. the Torpy and and you're just you're memorized. You're, you're just, you're thinking like, this is our backyard yep. of Prince George, like literally within an hour's drive. And, and it's, it's not just, it, it's not just east where you can head out. Like east is probably my favorite direction to drive. And you mentioned this in your book because what happens once you leave town east? You get into the, the ancient forest areas, the, yep. the start of the Caribou Rocky Mountains. After that, McBride, which yep. is probably one of the most underrated communities yep. in the province, if not nation. After that, you're into the Mount Robson area, the Rocky Mountain Trench, and then what happens? It's absolutely absolutely yeah. stunning what we have here. Jasper, yeah. Banff National <coughs> Park. And that's just along the highway, I mean, yeah. and then the back country on top of that. Yeah, and it, that, that's <coughs> a great thing about Northern British Columbia, is there's so much to explore. Yep. And we talked about this before the podcast commenced, is that during the, the pandemic, once this global pandemic arrived in March 2020, people realized that they couldn't travel anymore. So they started 
explore in the region. And that's where we have this Facebook group, Prince George Area Hiking. It went from 500 members to over 8,500 members within Amazing. a year. And the demand for your books went through the roof because people want to learn more about the area, started exploring our own province. There is this notion that you, to really truly go on vacation, you have to leave BC or leave Canada. And that completely changed yep. in the last 18 months. And it's so nice to see others starting to explore and appreciate yep. the beauty of Northern And, and it's worth mentioning there are other guidebooks. There's the one from the Hiking Club, which gives very specific uh, trail information. And there's yep. Rob Bryce's a very yeah. nice book uh, mm. that, that, that came with the digital stuff. Yeah, another great, great guy. And, and this book, uh, what I did here was something a little bit different. So I, I wanted to put some narrative in there, mm. and not, not just, it, it's, and if you look at the title, it says a guidebook with a difference. And yeah. that's significant. I had a huge fight with the publisher over that because their business was publishing guidebooks. And uh, I said, this isn't a guidebook. And you may not know this, but, but guidebooks are not eligible for uh, uh, royalties from, from uh, uh, what is it now, the C Copyright Agency or Public Libraries, I'm, I forget which, but one or the other. And I, ha I had a big battle over that too. And they said, well, send me some copies of the book. And I did, and they, they wrote back and said, you're right, it's not a guidebook, we'll, we'll pay you. <laughs> nice. So um, that battle I had with the publisher over that was worthwhile. So it yeah. is not a guidebook. It was meant to be something of a narrative of what we have here. Yeah. And in fact, a copy of that book went in the 100 year time capsule that, that was buried here nice. a couple yeah. of years ago, along with yeah. a letter that I wrote yeah. inviting uh, our successors in 100 years to uh, contemplate what they have versus what we have. Yeah. For example, uh, can they still see the Milky Way? Uh, can they see it in the city? Has the, has the city progressed to having you know, a dark sky uh, yeah. approach? Very <laughs> interesting <laughs> questions. And, and what I really like about your, your book, Mike, is, is the fact that it, it does feel like a novel. Like it feels like something you could read from start to finish and feel like you're on yeah. a journey. And w what you do a really good job of is, is you start within Prince George. You start with talking about everything from Moore's Meadow to Shane Lake, Forest with the World to Elsie Gun, like all these beautiful <coughs> parks and destinations that we have in Prince George. And then you separate it from North, East, South, West. You can head in every different direction and you can start explaining yep. what people can explore and the beauty that exists around that area. So I, I, you mentioned also that this is, you're no longer producing new copies of the book? No, that book, um, both editions sold out, unfortunately. And yeah. uh, um, but what I do have, if anybody's interested, I, I have a YouTube channel and I have got nearly 200 uh, uh, slideshows on that channel, uh, yeah. which cover pretty well every aspect uh, of this area and beyond. Yeah, and so I've watched a lot of the videos. The one I watched, I believe that you filmed it last winter or spring, it was up on Pilot Mountain, which mm -hmm. is within right. city limits. How do you get to the caves? That's probably oh. one of the <laughs> most frequent questions I'm asked whenever it's on the hiking pages. How do you uh, get to those caves? To I don't know if you want to give up the secret or not. But it's not my <laughs> secret. It's, uh, it's not a cave. It's just an old mine shaft yeah, that yeah. somebody built. So ba basically, um, about five years ago, some locals uh, built a new trail so you don't have to walk up the road. Mm. And uh, you go about a kilometer up the road before the first S-bend, yeah. and there's a trail off on the left. So if you follow that trail up, it's a very nice trail. Yeah. And uh, it's well trodden winter in winter as well. You probably don't need snowshoes even. And then you go up there, and it's just below the summits. You, you drop off to the left and, and uh, oh, okay. look around for it. All right. Well, it just that's the fun about ex exploration, right? Is yeah. that every time you go back, even if you've done the same hike or, yeah. or park, there's always going to be something additional that you can And there's a lot out. of stuff around here that, that is still waiting to be explored. Yeah, um, there sure is. Let's talk about Good Sir Nature Park. Okay. Because y you sent me an article, and I actually read it this morning, of your experience of meeting Jim Good, and you did a really nice biography on him, like showcasing Jim's story and and just how much passion and effort he put into this world-class botanical park, as well as his his small museums, by one with over 35,000 records of yep. his passion for music and then the other outlined really the the history of of plants and and flowers and tree species throughout the nation what comes to mind when you think of a person like jim good oh my goodness uh well i, I think you said it well in that in that podcast i mean there's a guy who had a vision as as as, as a youth and and he he saw it to fruition yeah i mean that must take some 
<coughs> incredible drive and, and uh, what he went through uh, every vacation driving across Canada from sea to sea to sea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, his description of driving up the Dempster Highway, I think. I mean, how many of us have, have done that yet? I haven't yet done it. Yeah. Um, uh, and the and the collection that, that he did along the way, and and not just um, the things that he pressed and documented, but the things that he w planted. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I really, I th uh, you were kind of putting a call out at the end of, of that podcast. Uh, somebody or some agency really needs to pick that up because otherwise it'll be lost. Yeah, and the future uh, sustainability of of Good Southern Nature Park is. Pivotally important. Yeah, th I mean, there's something quite unique there. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I thought when I wrote that original article that, that, that there would be some academic interest that UMBC pick up, but there hasn't been. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it may not be suited to that. I don't know. Maybe you know, they they wouldn't have the research history that they need. But some agency really ought to pick that up. Th there's a history of of trying to start arboretums around here. There was there was one at uh, out at the Willow River with exotic tree species that were planted um, near the Willow River Interpretive Forest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Northwood had one behind the uh, Doug Little Forest Center as well for a while that was going to be built in a spiral pattern. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, UMBC, I think, now have plans with the David Douglas Botanical Garden Society have got some plans. So there's been a lot of attempts to get Arborito going and, you know, some semi-formal, this one by an individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it would be good if, if there could be some collaboration. Maybe the David Douglas Society uh, could collaborate. That's a good idea. I know like CNC has their research forests as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and Well, there are multiple research forests around here. Yeah, yeah. UMBC shares one with UBC out of the Leeser Lake, which is hugely important mm -hmm. provincially. Yeah. It's one of the longest running. Yeah, because there's a lot of conversation in the community right now as we speak about the future preservation of Good Sir Nature Park. Yeah. Uh, Jim, like bless his heart, he is getting up there in age, and you have to start looking long term. Is this going to be fundamentally sustainable for not, not just actually long term, but even for the next half decade, yeah. right? And, and it, it takes a lot of hard work, as you can ask Jim, uh, to manage that park. And it, it really would be a shame to lose the past three decades of incredible work that's that's gone into that park on, on a janitor's salary yeah. as well that, yeah. that Jim's done. But it well, there's, there's two aspects to it. There's the park itself with the trails and, and the small campsite and, and the interpretive features yeah. and so on, and the plantings that he's done there. And then there's the then there's his uh, museums, mm -hmm. uh, both the botanical one and, and the music one. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a whole different question, you know. I mean, really, you need to get an archive, the Northern BC Archive, or, or the local archive at the museum here yeah. uh, involved in that, because the way that material is right now, it won't be preserved. You know, it's sort of plastered on walls and ceilings and <laughs> <laughs> unusual. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you do mention in the, the write-up that you did that you have to go there and and budget a large quantity of time yeah. to, to, to try to really take it oh, all it's in. It's overwhelming, right? especially yeah. the museum. Yeah, I mean, the museum could be a five hour trip in itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, Mike, I, I have to ask one more question bef before we get to the, the closing of the, the podcast here. And, and what does the future hold for you? Uh, you're in your mid seventies now yep. and you look like you're still very active. Hope to uh, have another five or 10 and 15 years of hiking, yeah, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so do you, do you still have plans to discover new areas or are you just looking to I'm enjoy? Yeah, I, I went through a phase uh, about 20 years ago where I did a lot of uh, fairly uh, far out exploratory trips in the far north uh, with small groups, so one, two, or at most three other people. And um, I kind of got that out of my system. So these days I'm, I'm sort of filling in the blanks. I've been uh, picking up some of the uh, epic trails in the national parks, like the Skyline Trail. I never hiked the Skyline Trail. I've done it twice now. Good. Three times. Nice. And how in long fact, is that? In fact, uh, sorry? And how long is that one? It's uh, 42 kilometers. Some people wow. run it in a day. And you start in Jasper? Uh, you can either start in Jasper. Most people start at Moline Lake, which is uh, less elevation, because mm -hmm. um, you start higher up at Moline Lake. Oh, okay. Um, and um, 
Wolverine, you mentioned Wolverine, sir. Yes. And I told you in my email that I'd seen two Wolverines, one of them as close as I am to you, which was yeah, epic. Yeah, four meters, yeah. And George was with me, he was behind me. One of the rare times he was ever behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remembered that I, I actually had a third Wolverine encounter, which was on the Skyline Trail uh, last year. Wow. And it was sunning itself on a snow patch, um, not too far away, not too close, but yeah. What a spectacular animal and yeah. so unique in, in terms of it. It's so rare to, to see it, one. It's very rare to see them, yeah. They're, yeah. they're a very solitary animal. You'll often, if you're flying by helicopter in the winter, you'll often see their tracks snaking through the mountains mm -hmm. going forever. Yeah, and, and for like, in terms of pound for pound strength for, uh, for any uh, animal? Yeah, I think it's second to the hyena in, in jaw strength, for yeah. example. It's, it, and you do not want to tangle with one. No. And yet the encounter I had was incredibly peaceful. Yeah, and, and can I read that encounter? Because I actually, yeah. I, I have it uh, just here. So this is an excerpt out of your book on page 109. And here it is. One summer, while bushwhacking around one of these lakes, I came face to face with a wolverine. It sat quietly on the same game trail that I was on, less than four meters away, ears alert, watching, with none of the legendary ferocity that wolverines are known for. We looked at each other with mutual respect for a while before it took off, running up the slope among vegetation and boulders, disappearing into the scrub alpine firs. For a brief minute in a lifetime, our paths had crossed and it seemed like an eternity. Perhaps it was. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and uh, this is an example of the kind of writing that you'll find throughout your books, that the way that you can magically articulate all of these experiences that you've had in the mountains and wilderness and, and make the reader feel like they're right there with you on these adventures. And, and what I'd say to people who wonder, you know, how can, how can they get to see something like this? Put the time in. That's all it is. You know, if you go out expecting to see something, you most likely won't. Yeah. But if you put enough time in, you'll see everything eventually. Yeah, and how exceptionally incredible of a feeling it, is it for you at the end of a day after putting in that work on a mountain, f feeling absolutely exhausted when your head hits that pillow, and you know even giving yourself a, a nudge saying "nice work today." Yeah, right? there's, feels good. Yeah, there's no better feeling. And you and you 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 typically end a trip like that saying, "Well, that's good. I got that out of my system. I <laughs> don't need to do anything like that for a while." But then by the next morning, you're raring to go again. That's oh yeah. Goes. <laughs> One thing we always ask our guests at the end of a podcast, and I, I want you to take a, a few seconds to think about this answer, Mike, is can you talk about a Canadian, whether you've met him or her or not, that you find incredibly inspiring? <coughs> well, uh, putting aside George, who we've talked about plenty, and, and Dave, um, and, and there are many others, obviously, as well. But there's one person that comes to mind um, and this, this is historical, but, but I think it's worth mentioning. John Ray, have you ever heard of him? I haven't. John Ray is the guy who discovered what happened to uh, John Franklin. And um, he, um, he, wa he was a Scotsman. He was a physician uh, in the 19th century. Um, he, is, he is arguably the uh, toughest outdoorsman I have ever encountered or heard about. Um, he actually came through uh, Fort George once in his life. Didn't have anything complimentary to say, but um, <laughs> this was a guy who was set off a hun on a 100-mile snowshoe trek to treat a patient when he was working for the Hudson Bay Company in, in the far north, Arctic regions. Um, and um, he was really one of the first uh, Westerners to, to learn the uh, native way of living off the land which is how he found the evidence for John Franklin. Unfortunately, um, what he found was not welcome news in London because it involved cannibalism. And uh, um, he was uh, vilified uh, mainly through the efforts of Franklin's widow, Lady Franklin, um, who was quite a character in her, her own right, by the way. And um, but he lived a remarkable life. He, he died a, a wonderful death. He, uh, uh, he kind of put all these troubles aside. Uh, but, but this guy was just an absolutely amazing. I'd love to, uh, you know, if, if I had the chance to meet and talk with the guy, he's probably one that would come to mind. And as a corollary to that, 
Um, the, re the way I first learned of John Ray was reading Ken McGugan's book. Hmm. Um, you heard of Ken yeah. McGugan? Yeah. Uh, and Ken McGugan also wrote, wrote, wrote a sequel to that book, Lady Franklin's Revenge, which tells that side of the story. The widow story, yeah. Both of those books I would highly recommend. And maybe this is something you can help with. I have been trying to, to interest uh, UMBC on two occasions now to bring John McGugan to Prince George as a guest lecturer, perhaps at a conference to do with any one of a number of subjects, anthropology, forensic anthropology, geography, you name it, yeah. uh, history. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of departments were interested. Some of you might even have had a bit of money, but it never quite came together. But I would love to see John uh, uh, McGugan in Prince George uh, uh, as a guest lecturer. And he's willing to come here. I had, I've had some correspondence with him. Yeah, but right. And you've being part of a lot of <coughs> conferences and, and guest lecturers at UMBC uh, throughout the years. Uh, yeah, plus I had um, many years ago the opportunity to work with a small sporting goods store here, Island Alpine, when they were here. They, they were bringing in, in uh, uh, world famous authors mm -hmm. and the deal was I would put them up and, and <laughs> take them around town, pick them up at the airport and so on, generally provide be a host and a billet, and in, in turn, I got to meet some incredible people. You got to meet some incredible Doug people. Doug Scott, the famous, world famous British mountaineer. Yeah. His first question to me at the airport was, "Take me to the climbing gym." It was a long weekend, and they were closed, and they missed a world class opportunity to have would one of that the have biggest climbing names in, in, in history. Would that have been the overhang at the time, no, or the croft? It was a predecessor. Oh, yeah. Okay. The, the one that was down there where CNC is. Yeah. Yeah. The croft. Yeah. I remember that place. Yeah. I actually took him to the door and <laughs> it's closed. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't even think he'd want to do that because he had a, he had a big lecture up at UMBC in, in two hours time. We yeah. had to have dinner first as well. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that when you have that kind of passion yeah. for, for the sport or the, the life endeavor. Mike, thank you so much for being a guest today. It, it really was an honor to be able to interview today. And uh, when I first moved back to Prince George, again, this is the first book I read and, and it really made me realize a direct reminder of how lucky we are to call Prince George and this region home. We truly are blessed. Yeah, absolutely agree. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Mike. Thank you very much.